Good morning, this is Professor David Weiss speaking again from New Jersey City University and is connecting Bridges and Borders program. Our series continues now with India, which is a very important nation state within our, our society uh, and is a important ally to the United States and is a emphasis on not just global business and global affairs, but also deals with many tangential issues that affect us all, both on an international cross-border perspective, but also within the United States. I am pleased today that I have such distinguished guests speaking on the topic of both science, entrepreneurship, as well as social programs that affect not only India, but also to affect the United States as well. And this is where the common interest lies. We have Dr. Mehta, who is a neonatologist dealing with prenatal care as well as on postnatal care, uh, over 30 years of experience. We have also with us Dr. Shah, who is a pedi pediatrician for more than 22 years that is also dealing with infectious disease. Uh, we have uh, Sridhar Rajapal. Raja Pol Polan, I hope I'm saying it right, sir, uh, who is an educational entrepreneur and deals within the uh, uh, spatial uh, sector of both education and how to incorporate innovation entrepreneurship within those platforms. And then finally, we have Mr. Uh, Aurora, Mohit Singh Aurora, who is also uh, risk management and is dealing with some of these important social issues that we are seeing in the United States as well respective to the homeless. Good morning, gentlemen, how are you? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, we're doing well. So I think we'd like to start, since we have such a wide, diverse uh, discussion of topics, which also correlate back to economic, not only policy, but also economic behavior. And we're gonna use the theme of the common thread, which is addressing now this new normal that we seem to have found ourselves in vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19. So I'd like to start out with our, our, our medical team on today from India and get some understanding and context of what you're seeing on the front lines. And first, I want to thank you very much for the work you're doing and uh, the honor that you are uh, uh, really deserving, uh, not only to those you're caring for, but also most importantly, for also the exposure you're giving yourself and the risk you're taking. And all over the world, we're all applauding our medical uh, support teams, our doctors. You really uh, have earned a badge of courage, as they say. So, Dr. Mehta, please, can you uh, uh, sort of talk a little bit about what you are facing, what you're seeing uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, really what we refer to as sort of the, 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 the pediatrician side of the, this uh, medical uh, process, if you can, with, with, with young, young babies and, and, and the uniqueness you're seeing within specifically COVID-19 and whether or not you're concerned that there may be some implications or uh, repercussions uh, to uh, babies that are being born. Yeah, I think uh, this is a new virus for all of us. As we know, there is not much literature and uh, research and data about what happens to the mothers and the babies, except there are about five or six papers and uh, presentations from China where they have identified 38 to 40 mothers who were COVID positive during pregnancy. But we have experience of the SARS, MERS, H1N1, and now with the COVID-19. Uh, fortunately, COVID-19, is much better than the SARS and MERS. The SARS and MERS had attacked the mothers in that third part, part of a postpartum, I mean, third intrapartum pregnancy in a very bad way with very high morbidity and mortality. Versus COVID-19, we haven't seen that much of the trouble with the pregnant mothers and the newborn babies. So far, there are only four to five babies who have turned out to be positive. But we know the viremia in different viruses from our experience with other diseases. And usually what happens that if you acquire the infection about a week to 15 days before delivery, then you pretty much recover and pass immunity to the babies. 
because when you create IgG antibodies in your body, the mother can pass it on through the placenta to the baby, which protects the baby. But if you happen to have infection right around the time of delivery, which in most of these positive cases, it was three to seven days before day. Dr. Mehta, I was going to ask you before the connection sort of went, you were start trying to explain about the placenta and what you've seen. So please continue because I wanted to ask you a question about the placenta and whether or not you think there's some opportunity value there in research that could be done if a mother's infected and then has that in the placenta or the umbilical cord um, that possibly could be something to be explored as well. And this will, Dr. Shaw, when we have a moment to speak with you in a second, I'd like to so how do you explore that? Okay. Yeah, so you know, there is something called plasmaphoresis, which is a part of the treatment for extremely sick COVID-19 patients. So I think there will be a role for that. Uh, right now, we are not using like cord blood transplant, which started in 1990s, early 90s. And it helped us a lot with a lot of bone marrow transplant kind of diseases. And it was pretty much replacing the bone marrow transplant when you use the uh, cord blood bank blood. So we are using the cord blood for that. So there will be a role in the future for that kind of antibodies. If we can find that blood, we can pass it on to the, uh, it's called passive immunity, not active. Like active immunity is from the vaccine, but passive is when you can simply give the antibodies to the patient. So right, there will right. be... But right now, there are only three cases where they were like IgM positive, because as I said, IgG antibody can pass through the placenta. So that is the immunity part. But if you have IgM in the newborn, that means the baby had already developed infection before coming out. Hmm. And that has happened only in three cases in China. So there is a possibility that babies may get infected even before coming out. Interesting. And, uh, that is not clear yet because all the other cases of newborn positive are after the delivery. So there is a big question that whether there is an in utero infection or not. Right now we think that it does not happen, but there are three cases in the back of the mind. So we have to think about that. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's a very important point. And, and that's a great segue, Dr. Shaw, back to you with your specialty, uh, not only yes. in, in pediatrician, but infectious disease. Um, Yes. Well, what's your what's your take on that? Yes, sir. One thing I want to share you there's a huge innovation by Indian Railways. Uh, that rest of the world should look after it. Our Indian Railway has converted almost 5,000 coaches to 80,000 ICU beds. So that's a great innovation. India is a huge country, huge population. We are a developing country. So to reach up to the end user with all facilities and everything. So uh, I would like to say this is a great idea and we are prepared for the, any emergencies, any increase in number of cases, whether they require oxygen, ventilators, medical, paramedical staffs, we don't have a great infrastructure. So can we easily reach to the remote places of the villages, uh, uh, suburb places. So uh, I would like to share this idea and the rest of the world should look after this idea. It's a great innovative and uh, business concept from Indian Railway. No other country has uh, come out with this type of idea and they have converted these things within uh, uh, three, five days. So it's a great idea. You know, and, and, and one, of the, one of the things that, that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing then is, is, is about the supply chain and, and, and developing out this supply chain mm -hmm. In a, in a faster, more expedient way. Uh, and obviously, yeah. as, as you know, here in the United States, this has become uh, a reality of, of, of a larger scope issue that we've, we've had here since the, the breakdown of manufacturing from the 1980s and the exportation due to labor costs, uh, offshoring, uh, which mainly found its way to China, starting with the open door policy under President Richard Nixon. So, your, your, your point is well taken, doctor. Um, my, 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 my question is a little bit more maybe specific uh, to this issue that is uh, complicated with the fact that we have three babies, for example, from China. Uh, one of the things we're seeing in the United States, and I'm not sure whether or not you're seeing it as an infectious disease doctor as well, but 
the, the the morphing or the changing or or the or the sort of we'll call it this this almost HIV sort of delivery system within the context of the virus itself, and that that by what I mean by HIV delivery system, the fact that you can have it, you can be asymptomatic, you can wind up actually winding becoming symptomatic you can recover but then it's still in your body whether it's in your lung tissue your heart tissue it's 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 somewhere in the body are you finding concerns over exactly what type of virus you're dealing with or the strains or mutations of it in india yes definitely sir um, there are all chances of antigenic drifting may occur due to uh, this type of different different type of viruses so we may come over the resistance of different type of drugs. Uh, vaccines may or may not be effect because of this change of virus antigenic drifting. So it's a great concern, so you are right. And, and, and how do you see the developing world, uh, even though the, the India is part of what we refer to as the BRICS uh, nation states and, and is sort of a bifurcation of the developing world, to the extent of uh, its economic uh, productivity. But in the larger scope of the pan, Pan-Asian, Pan-Pacific uh, region, which India is very close in proximity to, where you have a billion people in Indonesia, uh, what, what, what are some of the challenges if we sort of focus on that area? I mean, Africa certainly may have its own challenges. South America will have its challenges. What, what, are, what are some of the salient infectious disease concerns that you see that either the WHO or other international organizations must get in front of now, such as even IMF, to, 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 to address uh, what you refer to as this, uh, the supply chain or the, the, the economic issue of, of treatment and delivering? There are a lot of challenges it can be encountered by the WHO developing countries, like we don't have a good infrastructure. So the doctor's facilities, paramedical staff's facilities, we don't have a trained person and trained ventilators, ICUs. So there are a lot of challenges, sir. And, and are you, are you um, concerned that uh, with the defunding of WHO, from the United States, that sent that sense sort yes, of yes, a yes, message. Yes, that sir. Is a yes, sir. Yes, sir. So definitely concerned because just now, your Prime Minister has warned the WHO that they won't provide the fund, and that your country is supplying like 15 percent of total WHO funding. So that's a great concern. And uh, like China is told about with the idea that if USA won't uh, uh, fund it, then we are ready. We will be. And we will be fund that the WHO, so if U.S. has suppressed that fund, so that's a great concern, sir. And, and, and I guess my, my last all follow-up the, question. All the Melinda have... Foundation and Bill Gates Foundations are doing the great work. Yeah. It won't be possible with the, uh, if the U.S. won't fund the uh, WHO, because they are like, uh, uh, giving 4,000 crores rupees. It's a huge fund. Well, you know, that's a good segue into uh, Mr. Aurora. I mean, you're, you're also uh, on the front lines in, in a very uh, dramatic way that connects to this discussion that uh, Dr. Shah and I were just having. I'm sure you have a lot of comments on this, but, uh, you know, given the work you're doing trying to support the homeless in, in India, which is, uh, uh, I mean, exponential in population compared to the United States, but as you know, here in the United States, we, we have on the rise, even before the pandemic, our urban cities uh, have really uh, just exploded from, from San, San Francisco to Seattle to New York with a very large homeless population. And of course, as you can imagine, from an economic perspective, with almost 20 million Americans out of work right now, uh, even as we try to open back up the economy, that compression is gonna wind up with additional levels and layers of homeless. How are you dealing with it in India right now? And, and, and what, what, what are the uh, concerns that you have there? Uh, uh, and what are some of the lessons that we could be learning from you? Uh, thank, thank you, David, for this. Uh, so India is obviously um, in a lockdown of uh, a good 30 days. So it was earlier till 21st and the government had decided to stretch it till 3rd. 
so the first three thought which come to our mind which will be impacted is one is the migrant labor and the labor class which is working on a daily wages the second uh, part which will be impacted would be the middle middle class because right now the concern is they they might lose jobs which might turn into a, again a employment issue or economic issue in the future and the third is to ensure that the food is reaching out to the public in terms of migrant labor in terms of people who survive on a daily basis so these are the quick concern which we see government is obviously playing their big role in terms of supporting employment supporting food supplying these food to the areas where people are highly impacted government has announced various package as in financial package as well as food package this is what they are doing so th this is what government uh, is playing their critical role while there are uh, organization like like what uh, like the organization i am from robin hood army where we are supporting senior citizens right now because these are the people who are highly impacted as per many people have said so during this time we are supporting them and once the lockdown is lifted we have made our own plans to support millions of people across india and across nations as well to ensure that at least once they are back on their job they should not worry about the food or collecting or spending their money on food so having a continuous supply on the food chain is what our primary focus is thank you and and you know you mentioned your 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 good work that you do with the the robin hood uh uh, uh foundation or organization so Rob, robin hood army it's 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 a name it's a trust but we have name is as robin hood army understand so so because you're out there in the community um one of the other things that we we've been also hearing about uh which is separate from the homeless but maybe you can sort of give us some understanding and scope when the lockdown occurred a lot of uh international people and expats were sort of stranded in india and there's been reporting of backlash uh to 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 a number of these people throughout india uh even where hotels hostels started not even wanting them to be there anymore and there was nowhere for them to go and there were amazing stories as well of um uh people local to the community helping them and bringing them into their homes and getting them to other places into more uh, the uh urban areas of uh, whether it's new delhi or 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 mumbai what's going on with that situation can you help us understand what happened there uh in terms of on the community level and and are things improving with that situation uh if if i just uh, reiterate it right uh, the question is not only specific to the experts but also to the community in india and the people impacted in india right mm. so it's actually developed into another secondary reactionary yeah. issue as well so uh, immediate impact which we have observed the, during this time was uh, many many of the people or many of the many of the population in india is have have their children staying away okay and their parents are staying in india or probably they are in a different city the first challenge which they face is they cannot go out they cannot consume or they cannot buy their daily groceries because their children or their son is not available in india or probably in there they are in the different city so the first challenge which we have seen is senior citizen starving from buying a daily groceries need or going to a local shop and buying the stuff so this is one of the primary concern which we came through so through robin hood army we started a initiative called senior patrol we with the strength of around 60000 volunteer across india and in 150 active cities what we do is uh, we have a platform where anybody can register a request saying that okay my parents or a, a relation a relative of mine who is senior citizen he is staying in this area and he require pulse or he require grain or he require important medicine which he is not able to go out and buy can you guys help us 
so thus with the spread of these volunteer network we get this request we pass it down to the lowest city, uh, lowest city available so let's say if it is in new delhi or mumbai i get a request of my central database i'll forward it to my representative in delhi from delhi team they will find out somebody living in the local area there they will fetch those groceries they will fetch those medicine and pass on to those senior citizens staying there so this is one of the initiative which we are doing that that's a fantastic uh, concept and it's something that uh, you know we're really starting to recognize which is this more academic or in in the, in the case of what you're doing is the civic grassroots localized right. economic supply chain as dr shaw was pointing out that then comes upstream to more right. of the national framework in order to access the uh, essential products or goods or medical supplies necessary rather than the paradigm of going from the national fr uh, framework trying to create a one size fits all paradigm and then right. do a distribution which of course is as in a situation right. like this is is not necessarily a one size fits all depending on what state what region what the right. what the, age of the population is all these sort of systematic issues you raise so right. these are these are interesting uh, observations that you're making as well and they play a little bit on on, on both what Dr. Meta and Dr. Shaw said I'd like to turn um, for a moment uh, to some of these uh, system design possible proposals to um, our, our good friend here, uh, Sirdahar, who is uh, on the education entrepreneurship side. Um, you know, in our, at New Jersey City University, through its innovation entre entrepreneurship project that we've uh, uh, recently launched under, under our Institute for Dispute Resolution, uh, this system is actually powered by startup tribes, uh, which is a very um, important uh, element of community outreach that connects back educationally to promote innovation and culture within the ecosystem of a localized region. For, for, for example, in our, our city, Jersey City, which is a very important city, but is also right now going through a significant impact to the COVID-19, given it being an outlier uh, of, uh, of the New York City metropolitan area. But uh, being more optimistic and looking out into the future, uh, we believe organizations like Startup Tribe um, will play a significant role in some of these uh, system designs uh, that approaches that could be utilized in not only the education uh, ecosystem, but then as a civic uh, grassroots initiative to sort of go outwards, if you will, into the larger scope community within its borders or within its footprint. Um, can you give us a little understanding of the good work you've been doing in innovation and entrepreneurship vis-a-vis uh, -vis your, your educational uh, background, but also the, the system that you created. And, and, I, and I'd like to also ask you within that system, if there are other innovation concepts like mediation that could play a role in that process. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be speaking to all of you. But uh, uh, so one of the things that we have always identified is that, you know, in a circumstance like this, which was like completely unanticipated and one of the ecosystems that have kind of suffered across the world, it has been the schools. And uh, so schools are, are shut and this has a number of implications. I mean, it also means that children are at home, but it also means that, that learning can suffer and this is something that uh, you don't want because it can have a, a long-term impact. This is uh, whether it is uh, college students who would be in the process of graduation and you know, moving on their careers or younger children who are going through an important phase and you don't want a situation where uh, they completely lose uh, touch of learning. And this again uh, influences families at different levels. You have the well-to-do, you know, who are able to arrange some kind of education, but then you also have the poor. And one of the things that we have tried to do is uh, to have these kind of learning systems which supplement the work of the teacher but also allow for self-learning, which means that children are able to pick up what they would have otherwise been doing in the class. So one of our systems is MindSpark that I think you're aware of, which helps children learn the, the, the basic concepts that they have to learn at their own pace. So it allows teachers to guide if they need to on an, on an online basis or with their support. But if that is not available, the children can continue to do their uh, work and they progress. And, depending on whether they are able to spend, so we find some children kind of regularly being able to spend half an hour to one hour a day, and that's one kind of a thing. 
but there's another child who due to their circumstances is able to say spend only that much time in a week and you don't want those children to fall behind so in terms of adjusting to where they were what their level is what they are actually learning what their uh, uh, their own level of learning is so a system like this allows and what we did uh, like uh, other companies who work in this space we've kind of made it freely available uh, uh, for 60 days as of now and we will extend that if required so this has helped in terms of students continuing their learning it has been so we have found cases especially among the the, the better off schools where you know they are doing video lessons and online classes but not all schools are, are able to, to do that so these are situations where you know one is working to ensure that the learning does not stop for the different level of children it could be children you know right from grades two and three but also in the higher grades when they have their own uh, commitments to complete. Well, uh, that, part a, I'm sorry, continue, please. That's, that, that's a very, very fascinating uh, uh, delivery system that you have, especially for those that don't have, um, or states, uh, even in the United States, that are very limited on its resources due to the, the compression within the taxpayer base. So we have those, of course, as you point out, that uh, uh, have access to more tools and, 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 and resources that allow them to learn online. But there's another whole segment of, of even the United States population that uh, does not. And uh, what mind, mind, uh, mindset is it? Uh, mind, is, my, mind, yeah, spot. mind spot is uh, doing is something that can be actually crossed over here into the United States as well. Continue with your thought, please, uh, Sarah, what you were yeah. also on to. Yeah, I was also going to talk about entrepreneurship a bit because uh, one of the things that we are seeing uh, currently in India is a very, very vibrant uh, entrepreneurial culture. And uh, some of these entrepreneurs are working in areas like education. Others are, are looking at health, looking at ways that you know, systems like these can be delivered to people who don't have access to them. And we are finding that some of these platforms are actually helping these entrepreneurs work together, uh, find solutions where uh, uh, some may not have been possible. Or we have examples of you know, educational companies who had technology access, the ability to create apps, using that ability to create apps that can be used in a situation like COVID-19. So this is where we find that the, the whole role of entrepreneurship in order to approach a problem which was like unanticipated and suddenly came upon society has been really important. And uh, uh, one is, and I am. This is true for examples around the world. But we find that having this kind of a vibrant entrepreneurial culture that one is able to support can be a, a good way to find some of these solutions that can address these challenges, either directly in terms of the challenges in uh, fighting a, a problem like COVID, which could either be medically or in terms of issues like contact tracing or identifying people who mm -hmm. are potentially uh, uh, risk, uh, uh, maybe more risky of. Uh, catching the, uh, getting infected by the virus, or taking up indirect problems like education, which is also very important and you would like that it kind of suffers the least due to a disruption like this. So in that sense, we find uh, the, the key role of, of something like entrepreneurship and systems like this are helping to, to address the issue. Do you see a role uh, uh, where mediation, and it was a question I asked before, could play play a, a, a foundational support to the entrepreneurship process of educational learning within within your your development system absolutely absolutely i think what is uh, happening in a situation like this is that it is an opportunity for various sectors to kind of come together there are one of the interesting things about the the work that is happening in education is the fact that a lot of the companies we're talking about are working not just in india but outside and that process are partnering with uh, a number of uh, groups across the world. So there is an opportunity to kind of both uh, work together, learn from each other's experience and find solutions that have been working in, in one area and implement them in, in other places. So I think the role for mediation and to kind of have this kind of impact by, by, uh, by collaborating on these is, is extremely high. Can I just add one fact about Indian perspective on uh, COVID-19? Yes, please. Okay, there is a unique thing about here is that all the babies at birth, they get BCG vaccine for tuberculosis. And we have found that BCG vaccine somehow is restricting the multiplication of COVID-19 virus. So that is one of the big reason why 
there may not be so many cases in spite of such a close population packed in small area. So BCG vaccine is credited for slowness of the replication of the growth of the virus in the body. So that is helping, which is not common in West, Western world. What, where is this vaccine? Can you, doctor, can you explain a little bit more about the vaccine and where, where, it, where its origination is from and who's producing it? Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Shah is a pediatrician. He deals with this almost every day. So I would like to let him mention, like, yes, you know, BCG vaccine. Yes, yes. Uh, BCG vaccine, because of vac BCG vaccination, uh, our immune system becomes strong. So be, uh, and that uh, we give all child to the BCG vaccines, all newborn babies. And uh, this vaccine been produced by the Serum Institute of India. So, so this is this is really, if I'm hearing you correctly, because of your audio, this is an HIV sort of. No, not HIV. No, not uh, HIV. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Not tuberculosis. This vaccine. is a vaccine meant for tuberculosis. Okay, so so the utilization of the tuberculosis vaccine is creating an immunization. Yeah. Against COVID. Well, I think it's that's something. I think that's something that our our our, our wider medical community in the United States uh, should definitely consider and um, yes. and explore. Because if you're, are, do you have data now that you're showing on this, Doctor Shaw, that is uh, being able to be uh, uh, shared with uh, the larger, wider commu uh, medical community? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If I find it, I will definitely forward it to you. I have seen it in the well, literature. And to my audience. Um, you know, those that will be listening to this, there may be uh, an interest to reach out to to Dr. Shaw and to you, Dr. Mehta. Uh, so what we'll do is, as always, we'll have a, a link back to our podcast, to our website, and mm -hmm. uh, with your information, all of your information, uh, each of our guests, so that if there is anyone that is listening to our shows that are interested in also getting a hold of you on these uh, important topics, but also this particular medical uh, uh, insight that that uh, uh, you have now raised. Uh, I think it would be uh, an, an important impact to uh, potentially society as a whole. So thank you for sharing that information. And so, one thing is, you know, that uh, people are comparing COVID nineteen with the flu, the influenza flu, and the big difference is that nineteen does not mutate as quickly as the influenza flu virus. So for flu vaccine to change it every year, but if we find the vaccine for COVID-19, hopefully it will be one vaccine good forever. And that would be a, a like polio. That would be a wonderful thing exactly. that we can find that, uh, that secret sauce. But in between the that, we have to figure mutated. out a way to um, still go on with humanity while we're trying to find the, we'll call it the equivalent of the polo vaccine and, uh, and work together, uh, which is uh, what we, we hope to reflect in our, our, our programming here with Connecting Bridges and Borders. I wanna thank each of you for taking the time today to give us just a little bit of a glimpse, both on the medical side uh, of what you're dealing with on the front lines relative vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 some of the econ economic implications that we have sort of touched upon from the lens of the, of the healthcare system, uh, as well as on the community outreach to try to address some of these issues. And then as well on the entrepreneurship uh, level of how we can contribute towards not only the recovery, but then looking forward or outward uh, into the future, uh, tools that we can have available as we face these sort of unique pandemic challenges that I perhaps may become more normalized uh, and not as unique and novel as uh, we are categorizing them to be uh, in the future. So I really thank you from what I call the India perspective on connecting bridges and borders today and giving us a perspective of your lenses of what is happening there on, on the ground floor. Gentlemen, I want you to each be safe uh, and please to your families, your loved ones, and, and everyone in India, uh, please know that those here in the United States are, 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 are with you. And uh, there's a deep connection and closeness, especially on the East Coast, uh, like states like New York and New Jersey, where 
really, uh, uh, it's a very important relationship uh, on a friendship level as well as I believe a geopolitical level that we maintain a very close tie to India. And I hope it will only get stronger as uh, the years come forward now.